Hi, I'm Tom Kenimer. Welcome to a special distance learning program here on ETV. Today we're broadcasting from the Alabama Space and Rocket Center, and our special guest is a former astronaut who was aboard the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission to the moon. Fred Hayes will join us in a moment to talk about this harrowing experience that occurred over 40 years ago. Mr. Hayes will take questions from Huntsville Center for Technology students who are involved in a special XPRIZE project with local companies to put an unmanned probe on the moon. And we'll have email questions from other students throughout our system. First, we want to give you some background on Apollo 13 and what happened during that fateful mission. Five, four, three, two, one. Zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at 2.13. Apollo 13 was launched on April 11, 1970. It was the third Apollo mission intended to land on the moon. Three astronauts were aboard, spacecraft commander Jim Lovell, command module pilot Jim Swaggart, and Fred Hayes, who was to be the lunar module pilot on the mission. The trip to the moon was pretty much routine until two days into the flight, when ground control heard this transmission. Okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. Go, guidance. We've had a hardware restart. I don't know what it was. Okay. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. An explosion had occurred in one of the oxygen tanks in the service module. The damage was so extensive that it was determined that a safe return from a landing on the moon would have been impossible. At the moment, the astronauts are continuing to try to isolate their trouble. A late report says the spacecraft now is operating on battery power alone. Now the intense effort to bring the astronauts safely back to Earth began. Okay, now let's everybody keep cool. We got the uh, limb still attached, the limb spacecraft's good. Let's solve the problem, but let's not make it any worse by guessing. To conserve its batteries and the oxygen needed for the return flight, the crew used the lunar module's resources as a lifeboat to make it home. Despite great hardship because of limited power, loss of cabin heat, and a shortage of usable water, the crew returned safely to Earth on April 17th. Odyssey Houston, we show you on the mains. It really looks great. Mr. Hayes, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good to have you. Now, joining us here at the Space and Rocket Center is three students from uh, Huntsville Center for Technology. They'll introduce themselves in a moment with their questions. But first, we have an email question from one of our students for you. And the first question is, do you remember your thoughts when you first heard the explosion aboard Apollo 13? And what was your reaction? Well, my, my first reaction was, what, what happened? Uh, as was really uh, most of the people involved, including Mission Control. Uh, it uh, was quite confusing uh, for uh, quite a bit after that when we got uh, into position where we normally would be in the capsule. We had a, uh, seven warning lights on, warning and caution lights, which made no sense. There was no uh, single failure we'd ever trained for or seen in training that would represent this manifestation. Uh, so we were confused. Uh, Mission Control for about 18 minutes didn't think it was real. Uh, they thought it was a caution warning uh, electronic failure right, yeah. that had caused all these lights because they, they were in different systems which did not relate to each other. So it seemed like it would just shouldn't happen. Uh, so anyway, we went through this confusing period and uh, from there uh, got into troubleshooting. They were obviously uh, trying to save the second oxygen tank. We lost one as part of the explosion, and they were fighting through uh, a lot of troubleshooting uh, to try to save that tank, which eventually they found they could not, so we ended up having to power down the vehicles. My primary emotion uh, was disappointment. Uh, I knew with the loss of only one tank, which was verified almost immediately, uh, one oxygen tank, that we, uh, we were in an abort. We would not be able to go into lunar orbit much less land. So I'd lost my chance to land on the moon. So I was Very sick to my stomach with disappointment that we'd, we had lost the mission, the primary mission. All right, let's take our first question now from one of our Huntsville Center for Technology students. And Michael, give us your full name and your question, please. Uh, I'm Michael Hartman. I represent uh, Grissom High School and Huntsville Center for Technology. My question is, between all the missions to the moon, were there any design changes to the landers? Uh, 
from uh, previous ones? Yeah, there were major changes, uh, first of all, in both vehicles, both the command module and the, uh, the LEM, the lunar module, after the fire, when we lost the Apollo 1 fire, where we lost the crew. Uh, there were more, more changes made to the command and service module. Uh, the entire uh, hatch design, for instance, was changed. There were changes in wiring, uh, the type of insulation, the type of sealing at uh, connectors in both vehicles, because that was part of the problem with the electric chart. Uh, lots of material were changed that we used in both vehicles, even things like Velcro. Uh, was made more fireproof material. Uh, the paper we used for our books, a checklist, all of that was changed to a new kind of paper that was more resistant to fire. Uh, so all, all those kind of things were done with everything because we found that in pure oxygen environment, uh, things would burn that normally you wouldn't think could burn. So that, yes, there was major designs. After our flight, uh, there was again a major set of designs to the command and service module. Uh, uh, one of the uh, lunar module descent batteries was put in that uh, service module as backup electric power to even the fuel cells. And they also put an, another oxygen tank, a third one, and put it on the opposite side of the vehicle from where the other two were. So it wasn't in proximity should that kind of a explosion happen again. Uh, Mr. Hayes, uh, we now have a uh, video question from one of our students at Chaffee Elementary School. Hi, my name is Spencer Stein and I go to Chaffee Elementary School. And my question is, how did you get the idea of the gravity slingshot around the moon? I guess the, the, you'd have to give credit for the gravity slingshot maneuver to a fellow named Kepler. Uh, he was a mathematician uh, way, way in the old days in Germany. And he virtually, you would consider the, uh, the found father of celestial mechanics, orbital mechanics. And uh, he, he, he understood that uh, the, the body mass attraction of uh, Earth to Moon, and, and uh, in that case, the gravitational attraction of the Moon would be capable, uh, and actually in mathematics he uh, evolved, that would allow a vehicle uh, as it passed near another body to be, have its path changed by that gravity uh, pull. Uh, we, we used it for deep space probes, many uh, probes that were going like, I think the one outbound that went to Saturn, eventually to Pluto, used the swing by of uh, Jupiter, I think it was, to get a speed up, uh, both a swing around Jupiter and a speed up to get all the way out to uh, past Saturn toward uh, Pluto. Uh, so it, uh, it was a known, uh, capability long before uh, we flew uh, Apollo 13. Did you rehearse that possibility, Mr. Hayes, before you went on the flight? No, we, we never uh, anticipated, we never anticipated ever losing the command module. We called it the mothership. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was never intended to ever be shut down, uh, powered down, so it was uh, unique, a unique circumstance. Come up with the ideas right on, right on the spot. Right they had the, to on the yeah. fly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, another email question from one of our students, Mr. Hayes. Uh, did you get to talk with members of your family following the explosion and when you were on your way back to Earth? Uh, no, we had no capability to talk to uh, family. Uh, our total uh, conversation was just uh, with the Capcom, and uh, mainly he was relaying instructions that were devised from the experts in the room and really beyond the room. They were people all over the country that were pulled in uh, for the right brain trust uh, to help work through some of the, the, the challenges they had, to, things they had to figure out. And when they figured it out, uh, Capcom would read up some procedure uh, instruction that we would then have to follow. Now, Capcom is an acronym for uh, communication. Capsule communicator, okay. which was always uh, an astronaut. Okay. Uh, Sarah, you're ready for your question. So. Give us your name and your question, please. I'm Sarah Foles. I represent New Century Technology High School and the Huntsville Center for Technology. What were the biggest issues that you had to overcome on the mission? Uh, there were several, uh, uh, really, I'm not sure how you'd relate to them in part, they were all, all important. The first was to uh, uh, ration our consumables, the things uh, that you have a limited supply of, like electric power, uh, water, or oxygen. Actually, oxygen was not a short commodity, as it turned out. I, I, 
I did a rough calculation at one point of water and electricity, and water was the most critical, incidentally. Not for drinking, but for the cooling of the little, the few uh, pieces of electronic we had on. The most uh, critical, actually, I didn't even think of, and that was the uh, lithium hydroxide uh, cartridges that would cleanse the air of carbon dioxide that was building up as we breathe out, as we humans breathe out, we breathing out carbon dioxide, and that was building up in this closed compartment. And uh, there was a further problem in that the uh, cartridges on board the lunar module weren't sufficient. Our spares actually were down on a decent stage, and we were, if we had done the EVA on the moon, one of our chores was, was to get rid of the old cartridge and bring the new ones up from uh, in a decent stage so we couldn't get to them. So they rigged uh, a way of using the different shape cartridges from the command module, which then we had an adequate uh, supply. So that was, that was number one. Uh, the other was uh, navigating, which the ground could do, but then uh, t how to execute uh, corrections, because it turned out after we did two automated burns using the computer, uh, they, we had to do two more mid-course corrections without the computer's arm. So the ground had to work up a procedure where we crudely could use the earth uh, to sort of set us in the right orientation from a roll pitch landing on the cusp of the earth. It was like a half earth. And then uh, Jim Lovell would pitch the vehicle up till I could pick up the sun and the AOT, which is like a periscope that had about a 60 degree up angle view. And when I saw the sun, I told Jim to stop the maneuver and he froze it there. And that's the attitude then we held to do the burns. Mm. Uh, using a stopwatch for how long to run the engine. Uh, the third crewman, Jack Swigert, filled that role to mm. running the stopwatch to start and stop the engine by mm. time. So that was the, uh, the next uh, most critical. Uh, the toughest of all, and I think for the ground to figure out, was how to power up this mothership. As I said, it had never planned to be powered down, so there was no power-up procedure. It did not exist. So they had to start from scratch to figure out how to power up this thing in flight. On the launch pad, it had been powered up, but the uh, dozens of people involved to execute that power-up. So now here we were having to do it manually with two of us, really. Jack Swigert and I did that power-up with a brand new uh, procedure that had to be invented. All right, we have another uh, video question now from Chaffee Elementary School. My name is Miranda Mosley. I go to Chaffee Elementary School. My question is, how did you know exactly where you were going to land in the water? Well, the, the way we uh, knew we were going to land in the right place in the water was, first of all, uh, hoping that Mission Control had continued to do the job they'd done on really every mission to the moon uh, was to provide the right navigation on the way back. That they, they knew our position, uh, they gave us the maneuvers to correct uh, our position uh, that they, they had figured out. But they did the calculations and gave us instructions. So we had no way of, of navigating on board. The only navigation program was in the dead uh, command and service module and that software. We didn't have that in the limb. Uh, obviously the landing itself, we, f we fully powered up the, uh, the mothership uh, it had the uh, state vector, if you want to call it, in it of its knowledge. It was imparted, for, updated from the ground into the computer when we turned it on. So it knew a starting point. And then it fully, it, we did a fully automated uh, entry through the computer. Uh, Jack Schweigert flying it was there, prepared to take over should it deviate. Uh, but it followed, uh, it had nice uh, guidance with tracking needles that it followed all the way down. and. And somewhat a, a minor miracle, uh, considering what we had done and, and turned this vehicle off for four days, froze it, froze the water tanks in it, uh, but had never been tested or planned to ever be shut down in flight. We powered it back up and ended up with the second most accurate splashdown of the whole program. Only Apollo 10 had a more accurate uh, splashdown relative to its carrier position. We have another email question. Do you think we need to go to Mars and should we travel back to the moon first? Uh, I think we ought to go continually go as far as we can go uh, based on the technology we have at hand. Uh, and I'm talking, if you look very, very long range and I hope it's, I'm talking even maybe millions of years, uh, the, the Earth has suffered, uh, it's a dynamic 
body, or as we've seen recently from what's happening in Japan with earthquakes. Uh, I went through Katrina on the Gulf Coast, a fairly major hurricane recently. Uh, got three foot of water in the house I had mm. there. Mm. And uh, we're, we are uh, possibly going to be someday uh, facing with a meteorite or a comet. Uh, and, and just for whatever reasons, uh, no one's for sure what happened, but by the fossil trails, five times on Earth, all higher forms of life had disappeared. The last being about 60, 70 million years ago with the dinosaurs. Now we've been around evolving about two million years. So I'm hoping, uh, you know, we get, another, we get 200 million years like the dinosaurs before our turn. Uh, but I, I consider philosophically, we've been uh, given divine province. We uniquely are the first creatures that could plant this race elsewhere someday. Uh, right now, we do not have the capability to do probably much more than go in the solar, our own solar system mm -hmm. to Mars. I'm hoping that they will find a, a friendly uh, a star with a friendly planet system, one of which may be uh, livable, uh, similar to our Earth that eventually we can place people elsewhere. Probably, uh, at least in my vision with technology, probably the farthest I can see is something in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Because uh, he's, uh, for those, and I know one of you are studying astronomy, uh, it's a big place. And that's gonna, it's hard to conceive we might do much better than that. But who knows? Uh, we've gone pretty far in two million years. In fact, we've gone pretty far in the last hundred years. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm hoping that there will be a, a breakthrough, certainly in the propulsion scheme, that uh, will enable us someday to do that. Kiana, your full name and the question, please. My name is Kiana Hunt, and I represent New Century Technology High School and the Huntsville Center for Technology. The question is, what measures were taken to conserve resources? I'm sorry, say again. What measures were taken to conserve resources? Uh, basically, the, the, I looked at it first, and the people on the ground, uh, more of them, and uh, with more brain power, looked at all the systems we had and did, you know, basically took them one by one and said, what can we do without? Because uh, we, we did have limited, for instance, electric power in the, in the we had four uh, decent stage batteries in the, the limb behind us here. And we had two batteries, smaller ones, in the ascent stage. And so basically they shut off everything that could be shut off. Uh, the limb, if it was in powered flight, like to land, it operated at about 65 amps uh, load, 30, 30 volt DC system. And if it was just a drifting flight, normally with most of the usual systems on, it'd be somewhere around 30 to 35 amps. Well, they figured out a way to take it down to 12 and a half amps. Uh, 12 and a half amps at 30 volts, you know, amp, amps times volts equals watts. Uh, you compute that, uh, it's about having, we, the total power was like uh, if you had a 150 watt bulb, uh, three-way bulb, and you went to the third click on two of your lamps. That was our power consumption. We went down to, and that's, that's also the reason we got very cold. Uh, the, the vehicle chilled down to in the mid-30s in the limb, and it froze the water tanks in the uh, mothership, which had nothing on. It was, we at least had a few pieces of equipment on in the limb, and our body, mutual body warmth, uh, help the situation a little bit. So uh, that, that, that's the, they just took it down to where we could talk to people. Uh, they, had, uh, they actually had low bit rate data, which, uh, I'm sorry, high bit rate data available because they got the, the people that normally only work deep space for unmanned missions to, out to the planets. Uh, they got them to convert their large antennas to support our S-band com frequencies. Those people lost a lot of sleep. They had to completely change their station uh, overnight. So they used the big dishes to get the signal strength. So we were really operating from the moon, giving them high bit rate data and voice on a half a watt power mm. from two, from a quarter million miles away. Mm. Uh, during the trip back to Earth, was there a time more than any other that you felt you might not make it back safely? Uh, no, there's never, never a time I wouldn't, I, I, I saw no dead end. 
the only final concern was had the heat shield been damaged, which was nothing we could do anything about. I had computed uh, at the first break point I had uh, roughly the consumables. I took us down to about 18 amps, uh, just with a rough power down, which got us there on battery power to entry, to the point of entry. Uh, I ran out of water. I had water consumption rates for different uh, power usages on a curve and uh, figured we'd run out of water about five hours before we were to hit entry interface at that point. And it turned out we got around the moon two hours and we did another, a very major maneuver, the biggest one we did using the computer. That speeded us up by 10 hours. So when we cut 10 hours off, I knew I was fat on water too. I had, we had more water than we needed. Oxygen, I did not compute. I knew we had more than enough and we had two full backpacks, the things we we're gonna use in the moon. Right. They were full up, we could have used that oxygen as well. The lithium was the only problem, and I, uh, I had not even thought of that. <laughs> but the ground thought about it, and they, uh, they worked out a fix. Mike, your next question. Uh, my next question is, how are you trained to deal with the lunar descent and landing? How was I trained to deal with lunar? We, we, several ways. One, we, in simulations, uh, we went through, I, I couldn't tell you, the, uh, several thousand hours in, in simulators that were quite realistic except when you got very close to the ground. The, the visuals uh, were not that good in those days. So we almost always ended up landing uh, manually. Uh, uh, I'll call it by instrument flight, if you will, in an airplane sense. Uh, but during, during all of those simulations, uh, we were under duress from either from our uh, trainers that ran the simulators, putting in various failures to try to make us look bad. Or we were, we were in integrated sims with mission control there was a special group called SimSuit that devised scenarios for each of our training sims for any flight phase, be it launch or entry or landing on the moon. And they always tried some trickery of a mix of failures. The simulators basically could uh, emulate over 500 failures in the various systems. So they had that repertoire at their hands to devise exactly what time during the, the scenario we were running that the failure would be imported. Uh, and, and of course, they took great glee in making us look bad, you know, us uh, ourselves or us combined with mission control. Uh, we added to that uh, with the uh, use of a, a real trainer uh, called the Lunar Lander, initially research vehicle, which was tested at Edwards. And then we built three more of the Lunar Lander training vehicles uh, that we used in training. This was a bedstead used uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, rockets for attitude. It had two hydrogen peroxide rocket engines that fired straight down and then a gimbaled uh, fan jet engine in the center. And we'd take off with that uh, using mo mainly the jet engine and the hydrogen peroxide attitude to, to get up to about 700 feet and enter into a sim mode. You'd throw a switch and put it in a sim where a computer now would take over and it would reduce the thrust to emulate you were in one six gravity. It would gimbal the engine to take out air drag if you were moving. Uh, so it basically puts you into a real landing scenario. It was very realistic because you always landed very short of fuel with literally a minute of fuel left by the time you got this thing on the ground. We crashed three of the four. Uh, in fact, Neil Armstrong had a very close call. He ejected out of one and got about three or four swings of the parachute before we hit the ground. Uh, we had another fellow, Joe Granny, got about one swing in the chute before he hit the ground. And uh, the third one was, it was more graceful. He was sitting up at 500 feet and he lost all electrical power. And it wouldn't switch to the backup generator, so he just punched out straight and level at 500 feet, so that wasn't pretty Some easy. close calls. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't as close, yeah. But we, I flew that thing like 22 flights. Uh, you, it had the same stress factor. You got a lot of adrenaline flowing uh, to uh, control that thing. You really controlled it in a manual mode that was worse than how you had to fly landing on the moon. It was fully manual with the uh, decent engine throttle and uh, as well as your attitude control. Going to the moon, we used uh, a, a little clicker switch that through the computer you could arrest, you could make it set the decent rate. So you could refine your landing with that little switch. 
uh, one click up meant one less foot per second or one click down one more so it was uh, the real the real thing was done in a better uh, control configuration and what we trained for with the LLTV okay. Uh, we have another email question from one of our students now. What was it exactly that caused the explosion? Was it because someone made a mistake? Uh, well, what caused the explosion was, I uh, call it loss of the configuration control. If I explain that, configuration control is ab your ability uh, to map in some way, and in our case, unfortunately, the, the weren't, computers weren't quite here yet, so all of it was done on paper systems. And so you had to map all the piece parts, every part that went into a vehicle to its uh, pedigree and was it right up to date with all the modifications that had to be done, et cetera. Uh, our oxygen tanks had gone back through a retrofit, the whole fleet at one point because we encountered EMI, electromagnetic induction and testing caused from running the heaters or the fans. And so they sent them back to change things out, but at the same time, they were supposed to change all the components to be compatible with 70 volt power versus our 30 volt system in the vehicles, mainly to comply with Kennedy, Kennedy's power supplies. Uh, in doing so, the, the, the tank we ended up with had actually come out of Apollo 10. And this, this, so this uh, situation started probably almost two years before we flew, when they removed the tank in all tanks and shipped them back to Beach uh, aircraft in, Bo in Boulder, Colorado, and they up updated everything except one component, the rheostat switch. The rheostat switch was sitting still in our, the tank now put in our vehicle with a, was only valid for 28 volt power level. So now a secondary set of events happened. When they pulled that tank, you found out from the paperwork out of the Apollo 10, one bolt wasn't quite loose all the way, and when they tried to pull it off, the tank dropped. It fell about a foot and banged on the, uh, the uh, panel. Uh, it tested fully at the uh, beach, uh, did all, all the normal system tests, except the test where they run the liquid uh, gaseous nitrogen through, which is a way of detanking the supercritical oxygen. They run liquid uh, a gaseous nitrogen through which boils off the liquid to get the tank empty if you want it empty. Mm -hmm. So they had not tested that particular uh, facet of the use of the tank. Well, it ends up at Kennedy. We did a wet countdown, which we always did for those flights, several weeks, a couple of weeks before launch, where we filled up the, we were in the spacecraft, we filled up the vehicle all the way, Kennedy did, and we went to within less than a minute from launch and called it all off. And then they detanked everything, and we crawled out and would be back in there in two yeah. weeks. Yeah. When they tried to uh, run the nitrogen through to boil off the oxygen, it wouldn't boil off in tank two. So then they said, well, uh, we got spacecraft heaters. So they decided, they looked at it, and there was enough lifetime on the heaters. They hadn't been used that much, so it'll last through the mission. So they elected to use the spacecraft heaters to boil off the oxygen, excepting when they hit the, give, give it the power of 70 volts, it welded the contactor shut on the thermostat, which normally would cycle when the tank hits a certain temperature pressure. So the, the, the tank way over exceeded the pressure in the tank, way over exceeded the temperature. From here on, it's a I mean, they know that from the data. Uh, what happened in flight is surmised that during launch, the charred insulation uh, came off during the launch vibration, and so it was set up for when uh, Jack threw the switches to stir the cryo, a little egg beater in the tank, uh, it, we got the electric charge, and that's what caused the explosion. So all of this was a cascading set of events set up, set in place uh, almost two years before we uh, really flew. Today, all of that's in computers, configuration control, and it's great because even if a washing machine company, uh, they have all of that, all the parts in it. If you make a change in drawings, that's done through CAD in the computer, that's rippled through the configuration drawings, as well as all the training documents, all the maintenance documents. So all it's done magic through computers. We didn't have that didn't have those that back days. Then. 
Mr. Hayes, it's been a pleasure having you with us today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being here. Very with welcome. Us. And we want to thank our students for uh, joining us from the Huntsville Center for Technology. Some great questions. Thank you very much for being with us. And we want to thank our students who provided the video and the email questions as well. Thank you all for joining us.